13 Days of Halloween. A remote hotel, the most unusual guests, a tour guide that can't be trusted. And the newest arrival is you. Why are you here again? They sound like someone you trust. I know you. Can you hear me? Starring Keegan-Michael Key as the caretaker. Please make yourself at home. After all, this is it. One story each night, starting October 19th and ending on Halloween. From iHeartRadio and Blumhouse Television, listen to Aaron Mankey's 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Do flowers have best friends? I don't know. Hey, look. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. In the world of television, there tend to be two types of programs. There are the live shows, sports, news, the occasional singing competition. And those let you see and hear what's happening as it's happening. And then there are the recorded, edited, and produced programs. So the live programs offer viewers the most current news or information, but they're never able to take advantage of the storytelling benefits that come along with being able to plan out each episode and edit it together for the best moment. On the other hand, the pre-recorded programs are almost always shot in advance and then painstakingly produced and edited over weeks or months to polish it up, but therefore usually they're a few months old by the time they air. But in 2016, Showtime embarked on an experiment in television making that seemed daunting if not almost impossible at the time. A documentary series that would cover the 2016 presidential race in almost real time following all the candidates in the primaries and the general election, then editing and producing every episode within a week and airing it each week with very little delay. What resulted was not only a feat of television production magic, but also gave viewers an unprecedented glimpse into the goings-on of the political process in almost real time. It's called The Circus, and the program has, in the past five seasons, become one of the most important and valuable political programs on TV. Every week, including this year, it brings viewers a first-hand look into what's happening on the campaign trails in ways that no other program has ever been able to. I'm Clay Aiken, and it's Thursday, September 17th. And this week, Politicon is honored to welcome as its guests two of the hosts of Showtime's The Circus. John Heileman and Jennifer Palmieri to get their behind the scenes scoop on where the race stands just 47 days from Election Day. What are the campaigns doing right? What are they doing wrong? And can what the campaigns do really even make a difference at this point anymore? And if they've discovered it yet, we'll also ask them how the heck are we going to get along? Is politics still fun now for either of you, both of you? Do you enjoy it like you used to? Yeah, I love politics, and so I still love it. Um, it is not as much fun as it was, you know, when we did the first run this winter, January, February, March, covering the Democratic um, primaries. You know, there's like, there's no, there's no rallies. I mean, part of what I love um, is being able to go out to different parts of the country, talk to actual voters, um, you know, chat with all the reporters, compare notes. You know, these are all people that just love politics and love being in it. And you don't really get to do that. But I'm super grateful that um, the circus has figured out a way for us to travel at least some. So I'm in Lansing, Michigan um, today. I was in Pennsylvania last week. I was in Wisconsin the week before that. So you are still able to you know, connect with actual voters on the ground in these states. And in, and it's just so valuable to get outside of, um, you know, whether you're out of D.C. or New York, so a lot of people do politics are, and still be able to hear what's on actual voters' minds. It's a really but great mean, part of the show. You both are just, I mean, you're both sort of legendary in your fields. I mean, I, this is, I, I don't always get to do episodes where I talk to people who I'm fans of, but so this one's fun for me. Um, and you both really are, and you've both been so involved in so many different campaigns or following so many different campaigns. It's you, John. I mean, you know, all, there there has to be a huge difference. I just have to, I've grown up as a fan of politics my my whole life, and I watch it now with a different level of frustration and 
almost disdain for it because of the nature of it. Has that changed the way you look at your job, the, the challenges that you have as a, as a reporter, as a journalist, John? H- how have they changed from the time that you were reporting on the McCain-Obama race <laughs> to the Biden-Trump race and how politicians just behave differently in general? Is it not made it a little more frustrating for you? Or is it more interesting? Well, it's a it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think two things are true. One is I love I love what I do, and and I wouldn't do it if I didn't. So I, I'm not like about to throw in the towel or anything. And in fact, I'd say that um, in this moment with uh, the stakes of this election and this particular president occupying the Oval Office, uh, where you know I think that, that the country's at a hinge moment in history, and and there's an existential kind of threat. The stakes are existential, let's put it that way. I don't think there's, you know, what we do, what we do in the journalism business broadly defined is more important than it's ever been. And so um, the, on one level, the urgency of it, following a story where the stakes feel giant and where a lot of stuff matters and people's voters' lives are affected in a really dramatic way. And it feels like, you know, we're facing a very big fork in the road and the country will be a really different country four years from now under either of the scenarios in the presidential level, like what, you know, the choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump could not be more uh, stark. And so with those, with the stakes high and a lot on the line and people very invested and very uh, both, I mean, fearful, um, you know, people are passionate about politics right now in a way that's just grown over the 30 years I've done this. So people are, it's a bigger, first of all, Politics is a bigger, bigger church than it was when Jennifer and I started doing this. We're basically the same age and, you know, used to be politics was more like Wall Street, like people kind of paid attention to it passingly. And it was like something you look, you know, a lot of people didn't pay attention to politics except every four years for a couple weeks or a couple months right around a presidential election. Now, politics is more like sports. It's like everybody talks about it all day long everywhere. And people who didn't care about politics at all five or 10 years ago now care passionately so the story is bigger and it feels more urgent and it is uh, uh, and all of that makes <clears throat> makes doing the job uh, if anything more compelling rather than less compelling but to your point clay I think there's no doubt that the whole endeavor has gotten d- I mean the story of politics in my career has been polarization partisanship bitterness there's nothing, you know, it's gotten worse and worse in that regard. The country's more polarized. The politics are more polarized. It's meaner. People are, are more, uh, it's just more, it's meaner, more hostile, more tribal, all of that. So if, if you, if I think I'm more alarmed by the state of our politics than I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, more Doesn't alarmed it make it harder it. to be to to be objective to i mean it it can't be i sit on in, on this podcast and every week my producers drink when i say i just admit i'm going to own my bias because there's just no point in me not admitting that i'm progressive and i'm biased <laughs> i'm a democrat because yeah. <laughs> trying to pretend that i'm not even in this setting where i try to interview both sides there's no point in it isn't it tougher to be unbiased though I've never, I don't really think when the stakes are so higher, I I don't really think, I've never really cared about bias. So, um, that's not really the issue. I think unbiased is, a an object objective is a ridiculous goal. I mean, it's not a ridiculous goal trying to be, to me, fairness is what matters. So I, I try always to a, to hold power to account on both sides. I'm relentless. I'm a relentless equal opportunity bullshit caller. And I'm, I have no, I'm not wedded to the democratic party in any way. And I'm not right wedded to the Republican party in any way. And I'm happy to call anybody from any party, a liar from either party, a liar or a hypocrite. Um, and that, and that means that I come to in, in any setting, I come to the, to the table, uh, without a, without a dog in the hunt, I'm not, uh, rooting for a party or rooting for a candidate. Uh, it, it, but it, and, and so, but I, but I've written thousands of words where I've expressed opinions about things. My opinions are, you can find them anywhere. Like I'm not, you know, I go on television, I write, I have never pretended to be, uh, someone who's trying to be whatever objective means. I'm not trying to be their sort of, uh, you know, a practicer of false equivalency or the view from nowhere and kind of saying, you know, there's, 
there's equal there as Donald Trump would say there's good people on both sides there's not there's not good people on both sides and <laughs> and and in this case there really aren't and in this case the president of the United States is unfit for office and that's not a partisan judgment it has nothing to do with Donald Trump being a republican i don't really think he's his the extent to which he's a republican is kind of meaningless at this point he's sui generis and dangerous so i think you know i don't have a problem with that and i and i don't think it it has, doesn't speak at all to a partisan bias or any kind of systematic kind of ideological uh, leaning. Although, as I said, it's not going to go like I've always, I mean, I have points of view about taxes and poverty and environmental issues, and I've always stated them openly and on, and, 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 and without any uh, resident, re, re, reticence or hesitance. But it, your question, at least to me, the question you're asking is more, d- d- does, it, does the fact of Donald Trump make it uh, harder to be neutral? And if I were a journalist who thought neutrality was a value, I would say yes. And I think it's very hard for a lot of journalists who have pretended to try to be neutral to look at Donald Trump and try to, you know, kind of maintain some kind of uh, some pretense that he's like other presidents or that they should analyze him in the same way as other presidents are analyzed. And my attitude towards that is, you know, that's a fool's game. He's not like any other president I've ever covered. He's not like anybody who's ever uh, been a nominee for a major party. I've never said any. Anybody I've covered, Republican or Democrat, before was unfit for the presidency. Who's who's been who's come close to occupying the job? Donald Trump is unfit to be president, and that's again a, a thing that has to do with a lot of things. And Woodward, you know, is now saying the same thing. He's like, it's evidence based. It's not about scientific. Bias or, American is saying the yeah. same thing for the first. So time that's in that's that's, right. that's a, I could answer this question at much greater length, but that's my take on it. I, Jennifer obviously has a different point of view because she doesn't come to this front with any pretenses about being anything other than. A partisan, but I won't speak for her, but we're in a slightly different place about this. But I think a lot of people of goodwill, um, you know, look at the Donald Trump situation and say, there are the, you know, Donald Trump is not the whole of the problem. There are, there are, he's, he's, I think a, a symptom more than a cause, but it is the case that it's deeply, profoundly troubling to have someone, uh, sitting in the Oval Office who so many people, uh, not just liberals, not just Democrats, but so many Republicans, so many moderates, so many people who are unaffiliated in any way politically and have never felt passionately about a president before in a negative way, the way they do about Trump. The reality is, I think, you know, if you see someone occupying the Oval Office who is manifestly unfit, you are doing a disservice to your readers, your listeners, uh, your viewers, if you don't just come out and say that, if you believe it. Jennifer, there are a bunch of people who have never felt as strongly about a president in a positive way as some of these folks who who love Trump totally feel about him now. And I don't even know what the question to that is, because I don't think any of us know the answer to why that is. Um, my mother loves him, <laughs> and I cannot still figure out why, mm-hmm. um, even in asking her. Uh, is, do you, is, this, is this year meaner than 2016, do you think, Jennifer? Is it rougher? I don't, I, I, I find it easier to navigate than 2016 because it's sort of all out in the open. Um, in 16, I felt like on the, you know, I was on the Clinton campaign in 16 and I felt like we were sort of the first through the looking glass of, um, first of all, there was the first woman running, right? And I think that got, you know, a whole bunch of stuff got loaded on her um, in terms of our expectations for what leaders look and sound like and being suspicious of this woman seeking all this power and um, all that. Do you, what do you, what do you think the Biden campaign is doing wrong right now? Are they doing anything wrong? Are they doing things well? The, the, the race is tightening. Um, are there things that, that you're seeing in the field that you think should concern people who are hoping for Biden to win? John? I think that, um, um, I mean, by and large, the race has been pretty stable. Biden has been ahead by every available metric that we have. And I'm not of the view that like all polling is fucked and that, you know, it's all wrong. And, you know, I think that the, the state of play in the battleground states is tighter than it is nationally. I mean, Biden will win the nat though. Everyone kind of assumes he's going to win the popular vote by millions of votes. The battleground states will probably be pretty close, although it's possible Biden will win most of them. It's possible. Um, the main thing that I think, you know, people were very worried coming out of the Republican convention. And when I say people, I mean Democrats were very worried that Trump had successfully changed the conversation away from COVID and the management of the pandemic and towards a discussion that he was more comfortable with or one where he could more easily win, which was the law and order question. And then Biden kind of, and people were worried that Biden would be too passive in that, you know, that he had gotten very comfortable 
and I'll use this as a metaphor, and it's also literally true, but kind of campaigning from the basement, you know, and not being out on the field. And they talked about how he was going to start to do events and be out there more uh, in the middle of September. And they moved that schedule up pretty, uh, pretty briskly. He got out, did a bunch of things that first week after the Republican convention, did the speech in Pittsburgh where he denounced um, rioters and looters, um, did a, he did four events, four public events that week, one each day, essentially. Um, the week of the, in, in the wake of the convention and when things were still kind of on fire in Kenosha. And I think that c- calmed down a lot of Democrats, at least about whether or not Biden was ready to get out and kind of aggressively meet the moment. The thing that I, that I worry about, um, or that I would, you know, uh, the, the thing that I, the, the, to the extent Tell that Tell me what think, I should worry about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to the extent that the thing, if I'm if a, a strategist and I'm sitting around thinking about you know, what I would worry about if I was running the Biden campaign or if I was a Democrat and I was like, I want this guy to win desperately. You know, the place where Trump continues to have an advantage that many people, and I'm sure Clay, you'll be in this category, find inexplicable, but that has been persistent throughout. And it's a, an advantage that's meaningful is on the question of who's best qualified and best suited to manage the economy and the recovery from COVID. So a lot of people blame blame Trump for having mismanaged the response to the crisis. Um, but they look at, they when you ask them the question of who's like better suited to rebuild the country's economy, um, people, you know, Trump leads in that category by not a trivial amount. I mean, it's, there have been some pretty high quality polls that have him up by 10 points in that area. And obviously, you cannot, the economy is always a central question in the presidential election. So that, that's a thing the Biden campaign wanted to try to, over the course of the summer, to chip away at, because their view was, you know, that's the last remaining sort of strut holding Trump up. Everything else he's, you know, Biden is preferred on more. He's more cares about people like us. He's better on the pandemic. He's better on race relations. He's better on a whole bunch of stuff. But the economy is so central. And the fact that even though the economy is tied to COVID, obviously there's a reason there's 40 million people unemployed in this country. And it's because of the pandemic. People still, you know, by a healthy margin, say... Uh, something along the lines of, and there's a lot of people in the middle of the electorate who feel like, yeah, Trump didn't do a great job with the pandemic, but no one would have done a great job with the pandemic. It wasn't his fault. The pandemic wasn't, he didn't cause it. Did he do a great job? No. Would anybody have done a great job? Probably not. And in the end, you know, things were pretty good in the economy before mm. the pandemic and Trump, because he's a business guy and they worry about Biden and, and maybe he's a little bit too tied to uh, the left and and maybe he's a little too close to Elizabeth Warren and and Bernie Sanders and AOC. That's the argument the Trump campaign's making, and it's finding some purchase. You know, I'm not saying it's like a slam dunk for them, but there's concerns about it. And so, to answer your question, I think that's the remaining area of concern. That if if that if that if if you get to the end of this of this of this election and. Trump, who kind of inevitably is going to be telling us that there's a vaccine either ready or right about to be ready and that people are desperate for that to be true and they'll want to believe him. And if that is, if, if that's where we are and the, and the pandemic hasn't come back in a cert in a bit of big dramatic surging way in the fall, is it possible that Trump's leader, that pubs Trump's advantage on the economic argument would be the thing that could help him to win the election. And I think that it's a thing the Biden campaign has not uh, done well enough and they have not, they've not, and you can see it in the results. I mean, they would acknowledge that they have not closed the sale on the question of economic management. And I think it's a big question, a big challenge for them in this last seven weeks, whether they can move those numbers uh, and try to get rid of Trump's advantage in that area, because it may be the last remaining thing that allows Trump to win. And if they could, you know, on the conversely, if Biden could end up in a position of strength on that question, it would probably seal the election for him. And so that's, you know, that's the outstanding issue as far as I'm concerned. Jennifer, how tough Clay, is it? John and I talk about this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, all yeah, we talk about, I want to know how tough it must be for you. We to talk about close. the economic, well, we talk about the economic uh, number all the time because no Democrat has won the White House um, in recent modern history anyway, um, being behind the Republican on that number, meaning like, who do you trust more uh, to handle the economy well? And, you know, I just don't think, um, I mean, I think there's a very good chance that Joe Biden will win the election, but I don't think he's going to move that economic number significantly, right? Because, I mean, look at it, we are in the middle of the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression, and 
Donald Trump still has a somewhere from a six to 10 point advantage with voters on who do you trust more to handle the economy, right? There is not some television ad or magic five point plan that Joe Biden's team is going to come out with the seven weeks left. That's going to significantly change that number because that obviously is about something much bigger and deeper than, you know, who do you think is going to have the best five-point economic plan? And And it's tangible, too, right? Because he can't show them that he's done it and Donald Trump, you know. Right. I mean, Donald Trump's gone. Donald Yeah, Trump has the benefit of having had a number of months of great um, economic um, performance. You know, many would argue, like me, (laughs) that uh, the Obama-Biden administration put some of those decisions in place that allowed for that. But whatever, that's not how voters are interpreting it. But also, I think in this, you know, you, you asked a question about sort of speculating, like, what is it that Trump supporters, why are they so bought into this man? Because you're right, it like transcends issues, it transcends outcomes, it does not matter what he says or does, his core base is with him, and they're with him in a big way that I have never seen some portion of the American public rally behind a president before, right? So what I like try to do in this in um, you know in this role in the circus because I am a partisan I am I've been a lifelong, lifelong Democrat but I want to understand the other side I really do and um, I talk to Trump voters I did an interview with Kellyanne Conway because I actually think that Kellyanne is good at explaining what his appeal is. Um, and she's like, you know, there are people that for their whole life have felt like they were on the outside and nobody was really fighting for them and everyone else was getting something that they weren't get. I'm definitely paraphrasing her. But and this guy stood up and was willing to break all the rules, take all of the heat that comes when you say things that aren't politically correct because he wanted to fight for me. And now I also understand that most of the people that she's talking about are white, right? They're not, it's not, you know, mm-hmm. push back on her. She talks about the working class. I was like, really, you're talking about the white working class, which isn't the sum total of the working class in America by a long shot. But, you know, I, I really do think that we should try to understand what that appeal is because, you know, hopefully someday soon <laughs> the Trump presidency will be over. We're all still going to be living with each other, right? Is Have, so have, I have Republicans done a— my back. Have Republicans done a good job of making it, making politics about identity? Um, I mean, have they have they succeeded in some ways in pushing the Democrats to discuss minorities and women in ways that have kind of turned things into a party of white voters versus party of gay voters, minority voters, and women mm-hmm. voters? I mean... Who's, whose fault is it that it has turned into that sort of dynamic where, I, I mean, I'm from North Carolina. I think you're from the South, too, Jennifer, right? I mean, Yeah, I was born in Mississippi, yeah. So I, I look around in my state, and I see a lot of people who have either voted Democrat for my entire life, who now are supporting Trump, or a lot of people who really should probably vote Democrat because the economic policies of the Democrats would support them better, um, but who don't because they believe that there's no place for white men in the Democrat Party. Yeah, no. Who yeah. who made, who's at fault for that? Who made that happen? Did Republicans successfully accuse Democrats of it um, and make people, be- white men, believe it? Or did Democrats play a role in making people feel like maybe there wasn't room in the party for it, that that the Democrat party isn't as big a tent as I like to believe it is. Right. John, you want to talk about 1988? <laughs> I feel like this is where it started. Please. I love a history lesson. Go, go. This is pretty oh, Okay. Fun. All right. Go. So I in, think this is another thing we talk about a lot. Um, yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I think that, um, I think it's both parties contribute to it. I do fault the Republicans. I think that the Republicans weaponized race in a way um, that left the Democrats sort of no choice if you, in you know, my view, want to be on like on the side of what's good and just in America and, um, uh, you know, the people that have been excluded from uh, rights and being able to do well in the country. Uh, you're going to be on this, you know, you're going to be on mm-hmm. the the side of those people who've been underrepresented. But I feel like, I mean, what I think about isn't necessarily whose fault, but like, how did we get here? 
And, you know, the 1988 election, which where Michael Dukakis was winning really far up in the polls after the Democratic convention. Um, And then the Bush campaign came back hard and they really hit him um, on kind of a fear agenda. Willie Horton, the black man that had been paroled um, by the Massachusetts governor, Michael Dukakis, went on to kill somebody. Um, uh, using, you know, cr- uh, crime and fear as a, as a way of um, uh, motivating, you know, it's a really powerful motivator. And I feel like it kind of started there and got progressively worse. And even every Republican president tolerated some measure of this, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I hold H.W. Bush and W. Uh, in um, esteem as two men who really love this country um, and by and large did what they thought was right. But, you know, they also weaponized, they, they, they started this. And, um, you know, if you run a party, Republican Party, that's like advocates for tax cuts for rich people, to your point about not helping the working class. But also tolerate some level of racism in your appeal to voters by not, it doesn't actually help uh, the people who vote for you in terms of their economic standing. You create the environment where somebody like Donald Trump can come in and hijack your party, right? Because I do understand that he is not a normal Republican, but you create the environment where that can happen. And I feel like that is what happened. Um, I do worry about, you know, I have a friend of mine who's a pollster in Alabama, a Democratic pollster, and he says, you know, like his friends in Alabama are like, oh, yeah, Democrats. Well, that, that's that's the party for brown people. Like they just feel completely mm-hmm. excluded. White people feel completely excluded. And that's, you know, that is a existential How can crisis Democrats for, fix that? Um, I think somebody like Joe Biden, Biden can help fix that. I think Joe Biden is fixed. I mean, I think, you know, if Joe Biden wins, that is, it's the kind of, it's the kind of thing you don't ever actually put to rest. It's the kind of thing you don't ever actually fully resolve, right? You just have to like continue to work to show that who you care about and who you're fighting for. And like, I see a place for everyone to have a place in America's future, right? Like that's the vision of America that you have to paint. And everyone's got to be like, whether they're black or brown or white or gay or whatever, like they can see themselves moving forward in the country. And a good leader can paint that picture. But you don't extinguish these things. They don't get resolved. You have to continually, the leader's got to continually to push to make that better. Um, I've got a question on my list about the media noise surrounding Trump and all the controversies in the books and how they, whether or not they will or won't affect him. But I'm actually not going to ask that because I'm curious, John, <laughs> If yeah. Joe Biden is Teflon, just like jo- just like Trump is, you were talking a minute ago about how the 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 race has been pretty much static, and yeah. Joe Biden has been ahead, uh, and certainly it's tightening a little bit, but it's been static. Is is Joe Biden essentially, in a way, Democrats' answer to Trump in that no attacks seem to be sticking to him or working? Um, are, do we just are the polls going to stay the same no matter what comes out about either one of them? Uh, well, those are, they're a little bit like two different questions, although not, they're, they're obviously related. I mean, answer whichever one you want or both. (laughs) Well, well, I, I, I did, I I just want to draw a distinction, right? It is the case that, you know, our, because of our, how polarized our politics are, there is, uh, and and by polarized, I mean, tribal and the, 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 the bases of the parties are very, 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 very baked in now. And they're very large, like relative to history. So, Jennifer will remember vividly that Barack Obama in his first four years in office, and I would probably for the whole of the eight, but I remember more vividly the first four, almost never dropped below 41, 40 in approval rating. Like never. You never saw Obama in the 30s or in the 20s. It was like there was like 40% of the country. People forget this because they talk about the Trump base, but Obama had a base just like that. Obama's mm-hmm. base, in fact, was bigger than than, than, than Trump's base. Mm-hmm. Nothing you could do would get Barack Obama down below 40, 41. And also, he was almost never above 48. And he he did never tell anybody problem. to drink bleach, though. I mean, we have to, well, <laughs> we have to right, say right. he might not have had the no, controversies. No, I'm not, I'm not, I, I promise <laughs> you I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to compare them other than the, to point out that the parties now, the bases of the parties are about, you know, somewhere around 40% each. And even, I mean, Trump... It's amazing. It tells you that, like, you know, if you had a normal Republican president who wasn't telling you to drink bleach, 
his his irreducible base would be higher than Trump's. It would be his or her, and it would be probably in the like the low forties. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and then and again, it works the other direction also. It's like you know, Obama now is sheathed in this kind of romance of how of his presidency. But again, in the first four years, he rarely he never. I mean, except for when he killed Osama bin Laden, he wasn't really over fifty. That's why mm-hmm. the twenty twelve election people thought could be a real problem for Obama because the right track wrong track numbers were in the wrong direction, and he hadn't broken through fifty in his approval ratings. And I and I and I make the point not to talk about Obama, but or about Trump, but to say. The party bases are ossified. They're hardcore. So Joe Biden is not Donald Trump in the sense that he, you know, I think he would pay a, a relatively significant price if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue. And and I think Trump is probably right that he wouldn't pay much of a price if he shot someone mm-hmm. on Fifth Avenue. I think that the, the level of enthusiasm around Biden is not like the kind of enthusiasm Trump generates. The most of the enthusiasm around Biden, the deep enthusiasm is about is anti-Trump, you know. He was not, we, you know, Jennifer and I like watched this unfold in, in 2019 and into early 2020. It was not like Joe Biden inspired tremendous enthusiasm or energy out on the campaign trail for most of the campaign. When there suddenly was enthusiasm was at that, in those kind of key nine days when the party looked up and said, okay, uh, first of all, there was definitely enthusiasm among African-American voters. And then the rest of the party that looked up and said, okay, well, it's either going to be him or Bernie Sanders. And we just think that Bernie Sanders is probably going to be a ticket to disaster against Donald Trump. And so they rallied around Biden, but there's not deep enthusiasm around Biden in the party, but there is, there's two things. He doesn't have what Trump has, which is that kind of raging, enthusiastic MAGA version. There's not a democratic version of that around Biden. That's, that's true. But it's also the case that like small controversies are not going to cause Joe Biden to collapse. You know, because of the fact that he's got that 40, 42 percent that are just going to be with him no matter what, because they are so committed to getting rid of Donald Trump. And I think we're seeing that Biden's floor is higher than that even. Right. There's a reason why he's been in this position of of a lead, even as he doesn't really leave for months, didn't really leave the basement very much because people like were watching Trump and like, I just want to get rid of that guy. So I think it's like he's not quite Donald Trump in that sense. And he's fully Teflon in that. He doesn't have that same that that same rabid base of enthusiasm. I do think that you know in the <clears throat> that unlike Trump, a a a a horrifyingly bad debate performance by Joe Biden, you know, is a thing that could cause the bottom to fall out. You know, and I and I don't think he, I'm not predicting he will have that, but that is what the Trump campaign is betting on: is the notion that you know this is 1980 again. And but aren't they lowering the, the standards has, for him so much? I mean, by saying that he has, a, has to have a teleprompter, aren't they doing pretty much the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing, uh, raising expectations for your opponent? They're lowering them for him, aren't they? The, the Trump campaign is doing that for Biden. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, the, 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 the tactical and strategic idiocy of the Trump campaign, there are not enough words to, to, to capture it. <laughs> I mean, no, no one... You know, they have set up a situation where rather than raising, as you say, rather than raising the expectations and making it, you know, having saying, oh, Biden's the greatest debater since, since, uh, you know, since, since Socrates, you know, they've been saying basically he, he, he's, he's, he's an idiot. He's senile. He's sleepy Joe. He's, you know, can barely uh, string two sentences together. And so they've lowered the expectations such that, you know, I think if Biden does that first debate and doesn't actually soil himself on stage, he's going to be judged a winner. But I do think that there's a lot riding on that debate for that reason, which is like, I do think we're kind of in a 1980 moment again, where with Reagan and Carter, the country had decided to fire Jimmy Carter and they needed to just see Ronald Reagan and have him not be a lunatic, have him not be a warmonger, have him not be a crazy cowboy. And once they saw that, they were like, fine. And then, you know, Reagan was able to win that election in a landslide. I don't know that in our current politics, landslides are possible for the reasons I've been talking about relative to the polarization and the tribalism. But I do think these debates are going to be for a bunch of people who are like, you know, I really am kind of sick of Trump. He's done a bad job in this pandemic. I don't like the tweets. I don't like the chaos. I don't like the crazy. I would like things to get back to some closer version of what I think of as normal. But I want to make sure this guy, Biden, is not what Trump says he is, that he's not adult, that he's not senile, that he's not a puppet for AOC and Bernie Sanders. I want to see that for myself. And as much as we, the three of us here, spend all day and all night and and, and sometimes in between talking about thinking about politics, watching media about politics, um, 
I mean, Paul, Mary, and I would both say it's embarrassing how often we have, like, in our spare time, are talking about things like the economic number at, like, you know, 1030 <laughs> at night, and we're, like, FaceTiming each other to, like, worry about some poll cross tab. That's that we a saw. little nerdy. <laughs> it's more than a little nerdy. It's also a little, like, upset. It's, like, it's like neurotic as, as fuck. It's like, you know, we're out of our minds. But that's not most people. There still are tens of millions of people in the country who are, like, not really tuned into this race, especially in this pandemic. Like, that's been the crazy thing this year. We thought... This race was going to be really important. The stakes were really high. It was going to be the thing that everybody talked about and thought about all year long to an extreme degree. But then the COVID came along and the economic devastation and then the racial justice protests. And a lot of people around the country are like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really focused on this presidential election as much as I thought it was going to matter. I got a lot of other important stuff to focus on. And so now, suddenly, right now, literally now, Clay, right now, all of a sudden you're seeing people go, it's like an old fashioned election. It's like we're back to 30 years ago. In the analogy I used before, we're like, it's like Wall Street again. All of a sudden people are like, oh, hey, there's an election coming. We've been busy focused on these these cascading apocalyptic end times crises that have consumed all of 2020. Oh boy. Hey, guess, hey, guess what? Marge, guess what? We got a in seven election. weeks. And, you know, <laughs> well, I, it is very difficult. You're right. It's very difficult for me to believe that that is the case. I know you're probably right. But since it's, I mean, it's all that anyone who I know talks about, um, it's it's hard to believe. But there are those undecided. What do these undecided people look like, Jennifer? What, who are the folks who are what now Mitt Romney called them? He notoriously got in trouble for saying it, but. He was kind of right. There's just a very small chunk of, of America that hasn't made up its mind. Who And everybody wants to know, who the hell are the undecided voters? Who are they? Um, they are what, you know, pollsters will refer to as low information voters, which is their people who um, nice often are it. non-college, um, didn't go to college, um, uh, aren't paying very close attention. Um, and, you know, they... You know, I had the occasion to talk to some of these folks just out on the um, trail, and they have very mixed feelings about uh, the two of them. You know, a lot of them, even, and I'll say that one thing I've noticed in 2020 is when you do talk to Trump supporters, almost all of them will say, will volunteer, I don't love everything the guy does, Mm -hmm. but, and then they have the reason why they're supporting him, but um, so it's not as if Trump voters are totally blind to his foibles. Um, but I think some people, some, um, you know, sort of Romney Republicans, we think of them that um, might not have liked Hillary, so either voted for Trump or didn't vote. Um, they're, you know, they could be open to, I think that there's there's a, there's a small group of the uh, college educated ones that are, that are, you know, formerly Republicans that are open to it. And then uh, people that didn't pay a lot of attention to politics. You know, Trump's trying to grow his base by expanding the people who would be inclined to support him just didn't turn out, right? So sort of like what we think of as swing voters this year, really the game is about trying to convince them, you really are for this guy and you really should turn out. And that's the game that both Biden and Trump are playing. So it's a little different than trying to con- trying to persuade one over the other. It's more like you just need to get out and vote. After you listen to today's podcast, here's one to add to your playlist. I'm Christian O'Connell, and I've had this thought for a while. What if you took the world's funniest and most interesting people and asked them to share the stories behind their three most treasured items? When you said the idea, I thought, that's a really good idea. No doubt about it, the guitar. I think I know the the same chords now as I did when I was 14. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) From iHeartRadio, this is The Stuff of Legends. Add it to your playlist for free. Just search for Stuff of Legends in your podcast app. Hi, I'm Ariel Demaros, and I'm hosting a new podcast called Vice News Reports. With so much going on around the world, so many people telling you they have the definitive take on the news, we bring you to the news so you can hear it for yourself. From the newsroom that has earned more Emmy nominations than any other news team, this podcast goes where the story is, from conflict zones to the labyrinth of digital life. You've never traveled quite like this. Get the Vice News Reports podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I mean, you, what you said about folks being uh, saying, 
prefacing their support for Trump with, I don't like his tweets. I don't like his, I just yep. wish he'd be quiet, or I wish he wouldn't tweet, or I wish he wouldn't do interviews, et cetera. It is ubiquitous. Everybody who I, including my mother who likes him, will still say that same thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're, a, you're the comms pro. Is, is, are the attacks on Trump doing anything for the Biden campaign? Is it, is it irresponsible for them to take the, take the, the tactic of trying to convince people that Trump is bad? Don't the people who are voting for Biden already know that? And don't the people who are voting for Trump already not care? I think the big question, uh, Clay, is about COVID. So, um, right, I think that that um, is, you know, whether I, I do think that reminding voters, you know, this like this like systematic undermining mm -hmm. of what could have been a good effort in America that Trump did. It's really hard to walk away from that, I think, if you're the Biden campaign. Um when Biden was at his highest, Trump was at his lowest, was when Trump was at his worst spot in COVID, right? So I think that reminding voters how bad that was, how mismanaged it really was, some of the audio from the Woodward book, that probably is useful. But if you've seen Biden ads, um, what they are doing is they're doing both that argument and a positive about Biden, I do believe that people could know more about feeling, you know, could feel better about where Biden wants to take the country, could, could are open to hearing more positive things about them. They do know a lot. They know everything they need to know about Trump. But where, where the Biden campaign is going to be tempted to continue to hit him, um, and I would be tempted the same if I were on their campaign, is on COVID. I'm, I'm live in North Carolina. I've seen plenty. That's all I see. <laughs> I was like, I wasn't ads. sure. I started to see like, do you still live in North Carolina? It's nothing you but ads. You see nothing Governor, but ads. I know. Senator, president, everything. Yeah. It's yeah. all over. I don't you even have, know. I mean, you have quite the, do you have quite the deal going to North quite, Carolina. Quite the you year. Quite the big Roy year Roy Cooper, this year. you got Tom yes. Tillis and Cal Cunningham I and Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Roy yeah. Cooper is the one that I feel like I can breathe a little easier on the other two. Um, uh, my blood pressure stays high. John, I want to ask you uh, uh, to hypothesize, because this is your first, the, is it the fifth year of the circuits, the fifth season of it. And so I really hope you continue to do it. But what do you think the campaign looks like if the circus is still happening in 2024? which I hope it is, for my sake at least, because I like it. <laughs> how, does, how, does a cam how does the campaigning change when Trump is no longer the candidate, whether he wins or he, and, and is termed out or he's no longer running? Do you think these campaigns stay the same as they have been these last five years you've done them? Or do you think that there is going to be a calming effect if, if Biden wins and in 2024 Republicans have to recalibrate yeah well um i think it's a very good question um and uh it's a it's a very good question and a very big question um and 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 i i i think it goes back to a thing that i um that i had mentioned kind of in passing earlier i said something about how uh in, the, in our conversation tonight i said that i didn't think the trump <coughs> was a was the the cause of was the cause of 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 well all the various things that he's connected to is not a cause of the problem for the Republican Party, not the cause of the polarization of the country is a symptom of it. And and that points to what I think I what I feel like I believe about the next four years. And I think, you know, I'm like Yogi Berra. I i I believe, you know, my favorite Yogi Berra pol political philosopher, Yogi Berra, who said the prediction is always difficult, especially about the future. So um, you know, we've all lost our we've lost a lot when we made predictions, but here's what I, I think about this, which is that Trump, when I say Trump is a, a symptom and a cause, I think he he's not a normal Republican, or at least what we thought Republicans were like for most of our lives. But it's not like, you know, I used to use the metaphor that he staged a hostile takeover and he, and he, he, he of the Republican party in 2016. And that's sort of true, but it's also the reality that the Republican party was, had been hollowed out to the point where taking it over didn't require all that much hostility. I mean, it was kind of easy for Trump to do this, right? Um, and and it got hollowed out over years. And this connects back to our race discussion. But <clears throat> the Republican Party has become more uh, uh, downscale, uh, nativist, populist, uh, <clears throat> grievance-based, racist, yeah. 
uh, uh, xenophobic uh, over the last 30 years or so. And what, and the base of the party is all those things, white, uh, uh, largely non-college, older, um, and so that means by the a, future of the party is the Matt Gates of the party, not the Ben Sass. It sounds like yes. I think there's a, a case for that. And look, if I think if Donald Trump loses and loses, to, there's going to be a big fight for the future of the Republican Party. If Donald Trump gets beat and takes down, especially takes down the Senate with him, and you've got unified Democratic government coming out of this election, there's going to be a big fight for the soul of the Republican Party. So I don't think this is settled. But um, you know, Nikki Haley, um, Tim Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Republicans of color, um, uh, a bunch of other people, the, the Project Lincoln type people who now exist, the Never Trumpers, they will all have a big voice in this. But, you know, who's the front runner for the Republican nomination in 2024 if Donald Trump loses and loses badly? I would say that that Donald Trump Jr. is is as good a candidate for being for being the front runner. I'm who out. would be I'm most connected? Y'all coming? <laughs> Sorry, you're right. But but what is the Republican Party now? The Republican Party right now is a party where Donald Trump has 90 percent approval in the party. And as we've said before, has this giant base that he's he, he's 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 Trumpified this party. It is Trump's party now. And that's because Trump's party wants to. It is all the things I just listed. And it wants to be Trump's party. And so Donald Trump Jr., who's been and I, I use him as a proxy for the for the point here, but he's been obviously planning to run for president. He's been doing the things you do. He's, you know, traveling around the country, does political events all the time. He's learned how to raise money. He's raised a lot of money for a lot of other candidates. You know, Jen and I have watched people get ready to run for president, you know, the, in the prior cycle many times. He's doing all the things. And Donald Trump losing to Joe Biden claims the election was rigged, claims it was stolen. 35 or 38 percent of the, of the country believes him. He goes into exile, assuming he doesn't get prosecuted. <laughs> Wait you know? a second. He ain't going to be quiet. What? <laughs> he goes, he goes, right. He goes into, that's why I'm not, I'm not, not going to be quiet. He's going to go into exile and exile means he's not going to be sitting in, in Washington, D.C., but he's going to go, he goes and takes over OAN and he launches mm -hmm. a loud right wing resistance channel where he's, he's trying to destroy Joe Biden from the outside now. He's the leader of an aggrieved minority that believes that the party, that the election was stolen from them and that Trump is their martyr and their hero. Who's the best person best situated to inherit that substantial chunk of the Republican Party? It's not all the Republican Party, but it's the biggest chunk. It's the plurality of the Republican Party. It's the Trump part of the party. And, and you know, I look at Donald Trump Jr. and say, I'm not, again, not predicting he will be the nominee, but in the big fight over the future of the Republican Party, Donald Trump and Donald Trump Jr. and what he represents is more of the Republican Party than any of these other factions. And so to your question, which it took me a long time to get to the direct answer, I don't think <laughs> it's that a podcast. This, we ain't got a time limit. I don't think that this that this bitterness and partisanship and polarization and tribalism and negativity and harshness and meanness, I don't think it goes anywhere if Joe Biden mm. becomes president. I think oh, there will right. be a lot of Americans, a lot who will take a deep breath and, and exhale and be like, God, I thank God this guy is here and, and maybe we can get back to normalcy and maybe we can get back to decency and maybe we can get back to something that feels better than what we've had for the last four years. But there's going to be a whole other bunch of people, millions of them who are going to be pissed off and are going to be immediately from January planning the restoration of the Trump dynasty. And and so I think, you know, we get to 2024 and we will see a very, a, 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 a party defining struggle between these various Republican factions. It will be the most incredible Republican nomination process we've ever seen. I have no, know where it's going to come out, but I think it's going to be, if you thought that the 2016 version of it was, was rough and tumble. I mean, like I said, Trump actually had a kind of a glide path. No one even got in his way. That will not be the case in 2024. You will have a, a bitter fought to the death, you know, full contact, high sticking, uh, rollerball kind of quality Republican nomination fight between these various uh, avatars of these various brands of conservatism in the 21st century. It'll be fascinating um, and not and not 
placid. Not well, peaceful, that's all the more reason calming. for circus to still be around in 2024 because then you could cover it. <laughs> well, way. yes, Jen and I might and, be dead Until now. then, I'll just have indigestion. <laughs> 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 I don't know if I can. I want to move real quick to our quick fire round. Um, we end uh, with questions that were submitted online specifically for the two of you. If you're listening, you can send questions in at Politicon on Twitter and Instagram or podcasts at Politicon.com. Uh, Jennifer, Nina from Scottsdale asks... What issue is motivating women this year? Trump. I mean, I think that he just, I mean, it's just been, I, his election, I think, was a game changer for millions and millions of women, right? It was like, if that guy can win, when she got three million more votes, we are playing by the wrong set of rules and we are going to, like, engage in life differently. You know, you just see it from the Women's March to all the women that ran for office to me, too, just... I just think it like it's not even like an issue. It's an existential question that like hit us at a gut level. Like we deserve better, and it was weirdly empowering. And I just think, you know, he's been a motivator in elections in eighteen, and I think that's what it is for women in twenty too. Okay, John Brett from Nashville asks: Trump voters are ride or die. Should Biden worry about that enthusiast enthusiasm gap? He should. Yes. He should worry about it. And they are worried about it. And the other thing that, I mean, the look, they, 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 they're on one level, there there's nothing to worry about in the sense that the Trump voters, existing Trump voters, they it doesn't matter how enthusiastic they are. They only get to vote once. Um, they get their vote. Each one of their votes counts once unless there's, um, unless Trump messes well, with them. Okay. <laughs> uh, unless, unless I've Trump, already got enough, uh, enough high blood pressure. I don't need to go there. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, look, I mean, so, and so on one level, like enthusiasm, who cares? Like whether they're right or die, who cares if they'll walk across broken glass and, and through, a, through a burning building to vote for him? It doesn't matter. Their vote still only counts once. On the other hand, the thing the Trump campaign is counting on, the way they win is – yeah, and, and Clay, I've been asked this question a thousand times in the last four years, which is, how is Donald Trump going to win if not a single person who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016 has changed to Donald Trump? You know, he's a, he went, he only won 44, 45 percent of the popular vote. He barely won the Electoral College. If he hasn't expanded his coalition uh, and pulled any of those voters away from the Democratic Party, how can he possibly win? He needs more, and he's not going to have more. And the answer to that is. He, the, the, what they have been up to for the last two years, which is not trying to peel away moderates or undecideds or independents or Democrats who are conservative and are, you know, whatever. They are in a surgical uh, and, and, but very potent uh, and very aggressive and very well funded way. They've spent two years in these battleground states, Michigan, Wisconsin. Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, those six states, looking for Trump voters who didn't vote in 2016, non-voters. There are tens of millions of white non-college voters in those states who are have Trump voter written all over them in terms of what they believe, where their enthusiasms are, what they hate, what they love who just didn't vote in 16 because they were non-voters or they didn't really understand, they weren't paying attention, they they didn't really, they, Trump hadn't sunk in yet. I mean, it's amazing we go back to this thing, who's not paying attention? You know, there are tens of millions of them. And that's what the campaign's been doing for the last two years is trying to identify those voters, white non-college voters who are sympathetic ideologically and, and in point in terms of issues uh, with Trump and identify them, activate them, turn them out and deliver them on election day. And if, and that, that's where you get to the enthusiasm thing, because the thing that makes his existing voters ride or die is the thing that makes those voters who have maybe never voted before, but have watched the last four years. And as hard as it is for us to believe there are millions of them who watched the last four years and said, fuck, yeah, I want more of that. Mm. And that is where the trouble lies. And that is where if Trump wins in the end by threading the needle again in these battleground states. That's how he wins. Mm. I won't be sleeping. Thank you. Angela from Chicago <laughs> asks Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start knocking on some doors here in North Carolina. Uh, Jennifer, um, Angela from Chicago asks, why are Obama and Hillary doing so little campaigning? Um, they do what they're asked. You know, they do. Um, I, actually, I actually happen to know that you're going to see more of both. Um, but um, no one's doing stuff in real, you know, almost no, almost no one is doing stuff in real life, sadly. Um 
but they are both doing what the campaign is asking them to do virtually, radio, things like that. And I think that you'll see both of them. But, you know, they also both know there's only so much surrogates can do, right, to close the deal. You know, Biden's got to do that. Um, and some voters really need to hear from him directly, but they'll do anything the campaign wants. John Carl from Jacksonville. Vice presidents don't usually end up presidents. Will Senator Harris? Oh, God. Um, That's a good question, John from Jacksonville. Yeah, seriously. Again, prediction is always <laughs> difficult, especially about the future. I think, you know, she <laughs> she is the, you know, she she is clearly someone with ambitions to be president of the United States, unlike some people that Joe Biden considered for his, uh, for his ticket, who might have been content to uh, serve as vice president and not run. She will run, assuming, I mean, I think it's now crazy. People like make the assumption that Biden will not run in 2024 because, you know, he's old and he won't run. You know, he's only going to do one term. I'm like, I'm not, I don't know if that's true. I thought Joe Biden wouldn't run in 2020. Um, totally. but he ran in 2020. He might run again. Um, totally agree with that. I mean, Kamala Harris, you know, wants to be president for sure. And one of the knocks on her, I think an unfair knock, but still one of the knocks on her was that her ambition was uh, uh overweening. And again, I would say the reason I would think it's an unfair knock is I think all these politicians, all of whom I've covered, Republican and Democrat alike, the one thing that holds them together in my 30 years of doing this is that they're all narcissistic, egomaniacal, <laughs> hyper-ambitious <laughs> lunatics, all of them. Even Why the ones else would I you love, want to be president? Right. I mean, all of them are are all of that. And some of them are also noble and idealistic and and emp- empathic and and deeply altruistic. Like that's the, what's great about covering politics. To go back to your first question you asked me, Clay, which is like, do I love doing this? The reason I love it is because everybody who runs for president, or at least the great ones, are such an incredible mix of all of that, good and bad, the vanity, the narcissism, the, amb- the, the hyper ambition, the egomania, the insecurity on one side, and the genuine public spiritedness and idealism and altruism on the other side. You know, every great president I've covered has had both of those things. I have a great politician I've covered has had both of those things. So, you know, Kamala Harris has the, all of that, I would say. And she's clearly going to be lining up, whether it's in 2024 or 2028, she's clearly going to be uh, running for president. Uh, and I think she is going to, she has obviously demonstrated both in her run, in her run for in 2019, she demonstrated both some incredible strengths and some incredibly large weaknesses. And I think the question of whether or not she becomes, uh, whether she becomes president or not, whether she becomes the nominee of her party will be determined by uh, her ability to learn over the next four years, whether she gets better and whether she, um, can take the things that she does very well, the excitement she she generates, their ability to 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 build a passionate uh, base of support. She's obviously really smart. She's a, a can be a very effective political performer. She's a great prosecutor of issues. She's a gr- good attack dog. Uh, you know, she's ch- her charming and authentic and 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 a lot of things. At the same time, you know, she had some kind of fatal flaws that made that were the reason why she didn't perform better in 2019. And if she's going to have to focus on on those things, and I think those things get to some very core questions of like, what is she about? What does she believe? What does she want to do? Those are the problems with her candidacy. She could never, she could never really uh, just kind of t- explain to people in a clear, coherent way what her theory of the case was and what her her, her positive uh, overarching vision for where she wanted to take the country was. Those are things she did not do that well, and she paid a price for it. Uh, so she's going to have to get some of that. And if she can get some of that, if she can remedy her weaknesses and couple them with the strengths, the undeniable strengths she has, she could be the nominee of the party and she could be president. But um, she's not there yet. Well, can I add something, for, Chloe, yeah, to that? Yeah, please. Um, just that, because um, John, I mean, John's right. I think that, you know, people are focused on her ambition wrongly. And that is, um, I've observed that something that happens to women. And, you know, Chris Dodd had one of Biden's advisors said, you know, well, she's too ambitious. And you don't want somebody who's that ambitious to be a partner because they can't be a good partner. And, you know, you know who managed to do that? Joe Biden. Joe Biden mm-hmm. ran against Barack Obama in 2008. He t- he said that Barack Obama was not qualified to be president when he ran against him and then managed to serve ably and loyally as a good partner um, for uh, all throughout the presidency and then run to be president again. 
uh, you know, and then do another run for president. So, like, it can happen. You can take your ambition and and keep it in check, um, all that frightful ambition. And so I was glad that, like, that it's too bad that, like, Harris was subjected to that, but it's good that it didn't stop Biden from from picking her. But like that's a it's a long road to being the nominee in twenty twenty four. I don't know necessarily that being the vice president is the best. Perch it's only happened. From which to it's only that. happened once in one hundred and fifty years too. Right? Yeah, the it's like it, I mean, it seems like oh, total setup for her. Not necessarily because there's a lot of scrutiny that happens between now and then, and yeah, and and everything that John said about uh, what she needs to do to prove to be a good candidate. So Politicon started this podcast with the goal of trying to to get people to talk across the aisle with each other instead of at each other. And we discovered somewhere maybe 10 weeks in after nine to 10 episodes of people screaming at each other, despite my best efforts to get them to talk rationally, <laughs> that putting people on an episode of this podcast with someone who disagrees with them just wasn't very successful. And so we have we have kind of shifted towards more one-on-one conversations, people who come from the same background or people who have a, a similar interest or, or the s- similar things to talk about. We haven't really been able to successfully have a, a staunch Trump supporter and a staunch Democrat on at the same time. It's just not been very successful. And it frustrates me because I have grown up being the only Democrat in my family um, (laughs) and surrounded by a lot of Trump supporters in my family, in my life in general. And I learned, you know, sometimes you have to recognize we're not always going to get our way. Uh, Both sides want their way. And in the past, they've learned to sit together and try to compromise or collaborate on a solution, and we don't do that anymore. But what we still want to do with this podcast, if possible, is try to figure out, hopefully, that there's a way to do that in the future. So my last question, and I'm going to start with Jennifer so that John has a little bit of time to get a little more optimistic for me because I need it. Jennifer, how the heck are we going to get along? (laughs) Well, I tried my own life, Clay. I mean, I have, um, you know, like I said, I was born in Mississippi. I have a girlfriend who was like my best friend from when I was in first grade um, that I'm still friends with. She is like, we have gone very different paths. Um, (laughs) But I find, I stay in touch with her and, you know, she says things to me like, wow, gee, you work hard. (laughs) (laughs) Gee, we're all so proud of how hard you work. (laughs) You know um, what? She's trying, girl. <laughs> she's trying. She's trying to find a place. Or she's like, I saw you on Fox. Good for you for trying <laughs> to, like, be on the other side. Um, and, I, I mean, I just, I really try in my own life. So I try with my friends that are Trump supporters, and I do have them, and members of my own family. And this is why I wanted to sit down and interview Kellyanne Conway, which uh, mm-hmm. the circus let me do. Um not to argue with her point by point, but for her to tell me, like, what am I not getting? You say I'm not getting it. Like, I'm never going to agree with you on policy, but, like, explain to me what you see happening here, and let me explain to you what I see happening. Let me explain to you why I feel this way, and you tell me why you feel that way, and at least we can understand. And when I meet Trump supporters, then I think they're like, oh, my God, it's Hillary Clinton's communications director, and they think we're going to breathe fire and have, like, (laughs) horns coming out of my head. And to just talk about sports or something so that they see I'm not, like, a crazy woman, and there's something to connect to, right? And then I don't know where it goes from there or if that's just foolish on my part, but, like, it's somewhere to start. And I do feel like, which has, again, been good about this being uh, being able to be part of the circus this year is, you know, having more exposure to the Trump staff, having more exposure to Republicans and to voters to, you know, get it a little more. And it has changed the way I see things. So I, I, I that makes me hopeful. John, how the heck are we going to get along? He's speechless the first time, the whole episode. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have an answer. I, I uh, Just be honest. If you don't think we're going to, you can say it. But I do, I do wonder. I'll tell you what I, what, I, what I think, you know, would be really healthy for the country. I'll tell you where, I mean, I find the place where I get along with uh, people who I disagree with about politics and the place where uh, – 
other people get along with people that they disagree with about politics. It's when they're not talking about politics. And I'm, you know, as big a political junkie and nerd and whatever you want to call it. Like I love politics. I'm, you know, I'm in the middle of it all the time. We've talked about this already on this podcast, but you know, there's a, I think that as much as I, I, when I said before about how, you know, politics has gone from being like wall street to being like sports and it's pervasive, it's everywhere now. And we're all on a team and it's tribal and blah, blah, blah. I, I'm not, I'm not honestly not saying, I think that's a good thing. And I think that, you know, the spaces in American life that are not infected by politics, which is increasingly a few, but, you know, whether it's at a sports event or in a cultural setting at a concert, like, I don't know when I go to a U2 show, who's what, like what the politics of those people are. I don't know. I mean, I, I like hip hop groups. I like heavy metal groups. I like country performers. I like jazz. I like and I and I, I know that there's probably some like there's data on this on every one of those genres, right? About what's who's which what the genres tend to be more democratic, more republican. But in truth, when I'm experiencing the music, I'm not think I'm not living in that space, right? And when I'm at a at a at a Giants game or a, a Mets game or a Jets game or a Knicks game or a Yankees game, I'm listing all New York teams here, but I'm at, I'm at, 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 when I'm at those games, like the, the crowd, the politics kind of melt away. And again, because of Trump, you know, you hear him yelling at Colin Kaepernick. And so, yeah, sports gets dragged into politics too. But I wonder whether part of the answer here is that what we really most need is to somehow, and I don't have a mechanism for this. I don't have a path. I have like, how does this happen? What's the recipe for it? I don't know. But a more vibrant and larger civic life in America that where politics is not welcome, you know, and, and I mean politics in the Republican Democrat sense of politics, where we can have disagreements and we can have enthusiasms and we can even have teams that we root for and teams that we root against, but where they're not rooted in the red and the blue, they're not rooted in the liberal and conservative. And somehow if we can enlarge that space, the civic space, places for civic participation, places for, you know, uh, all of our enthusiasms, not our vocations, but our avocations. If we could enlarge that, I think we'd be a healthier society, you know? And I don't know, again, like I said, I had no idea how to, how to do that, but there's this kind of, you know, that communitarian space, you know, civil, civil society, civic association, stuff that's not where you don't have to identify yourself as Democrat or Republican to walk in the door and where the things that are debated and discussed, you know, obviously have political in the small P political cultural sense, they have resonance, but they're not pulled into the Fox news versus MSNBC of it all in every, in every instant. I think that would be really, really good for the country. And, and, and I would love for someone who is smarter than me to explain how we get there because I think it would be a good place to land, but I don't know the, I don't really don't know the route. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody has the answer because we're not doing it, but over, over 29, almost 30 episodes of this, I can say the one thing that I, I have, I truly believe now when people ask me how the heck we're going to get along is step one is you have to want it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're not quite to a place yet where enough people want it. Um, but I appreciate that you got, I mean, Jennifer, your answer is spot on for me. I do try to do the same thing in my life. And, and I appreciate that your show does the best that it can do as well of showing both sides and trying to, to not, you know, it's not a show that it's not a show that's trying to look for the most controversial and the most shouty, screamy moments. And, and that's, you know, of course you can't avoid them. We can't avoid them on this podcast either, but, uh, but I appreciate that about it. And anyone who's listening, if you don't already watch the circus Sundays on Showtime, or you can get it on the Showtime app. Um, I really encourage people to, to take a kind of behind the curtain look at the political process. Go back and watch 2016's watch all five seasons if you haven't done it yet, but you can, you can really get almost real time really, um, of, of what's happening this year in the race. And, and, it's hosted by several people, but two of which who you've heard here um, kind of want people to get along. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's the first step. Uh, John Heilman, Jennifer Palmieri, I cannot thank you enough for being with us uh, this week. Uh, if you're listening, thank you. If you liked it, like it, 
on the podcast app. I don't know how this stuff works. Subscribe and and review and do all that fancy stuff. If you're celebrating uh, Rosh Hashanah this weekend, have a uh, Shana Tova and a Happy New Year. And we will see you back here next week on How the Heck Are We Going to Get Along? 13 Days of Halloween. A remote hotel, the most unusual guests, a tour guide that can't be trusted. And the newest arrival is you. Why are you here again? They sound like someone you trust. I know you can hear me. Starring Keegan Michael Key as the caretaker. Please make yourself at home. After all, this is it. One story each night, starting October 19th and ending on Halloween. From iHeartRadio and Blumhouse Television, listen to Aaron Mankey's 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. On September 17th, 2009, 24-year-old Mitrice Richardson disappeared without a trace in the woods near Malibu, California, and was never seen alive again. I'm Katherine Townsend, host of the podcast, Helen Gone. We're going to try to find out what really happened to Mitrice Richardson. School of Humans and iHeartRadio present Helen Gone Season 3. Listen to Helen Gone on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.